Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my 2022 Jewish SFF reading uh, review video. Uh, to be more specific, I am about to review two of the novels written by Yohi Brandis. Uh, and they are biblically inspired uh, novels, so I decided I wanted to read them for Sci-Fi September uh, and uh, do a review of them, uh, even though I know it's <laughs> a bit more of a strain than usual to uh, call these novels science fiction or even fantasy uh, to a degree, but uh, mostly I was just excited to read them and honestly I think I was more impressed by them than I even anticipated, so, so that's exciting too. So anyway, uh, I'll start with a little bit of a brief bio that I'm taking from the Institute for the Translation of Hebrew Literature. So Yohi Brandis was born in 1959 in Haifa to a family of Hasidic rabbis. And she holds a BA in Biblical Studies and an MA in Judaic Studies. So she knows her stuff and has taught Bible and Judaism for many years and has uh, participated in uh, TV programs and Jewish studies and had her own column in the daily newspaper Ma'ariv, and was the editor of a book series on Judaism. And she continues to lecture widely on the Bible and literature. And her books are uh, bestsellers in Israel, and I believe both of uh, the original Hebrew versions of the two books I'll be talking about have won awards. So there we have it, and of course I've already said that I very much enjoyed these books, but now I'm going to take a deeper dive. I'll start with the second of the two books uh, that I've read from her that I just finished up, although it was the first that she both wrote and was translated into English. This is The Secret Book of Kings, and the translator is Yardin Greenspan. And this is a book that takes place roughly around the 10th century BCE, around the time of uh, the reigns of King Saul and King David and King Solomon, and it is an alternative retelling which I guess is speculative in its own way, an alternate history, uh, because it takes uh, the books of Kings and the books of Chronicles from the Bible, uh, some very well-trod tales about like who the goodies and the baddies are uh, when it comes uh, to the kings of Israel uh, and uh, to Judah, and uh, spins it on its head because, you know, there was a little bit of strife and some like... Uh, I guess you might say even civil war between some of the tribes of Israel at the time, uh, and really only the winners get to tell the major history, and so this really posits the question, what if uh, the losers got to have a say? Uh, and particularly the, in this case, this has to do with uh, the families of uh, King David and Solomon versus the family of uh, King Saul, uh, who David pretty much took the kingdom from, uh, and there was some back and forth after that, and uh, there were two, you know, ancient kingdoms, the ancient kingdom of uh, Judah in the south and the ancient kingdom of Israel in the north, and even like a couple more kings, I believe, uh, in uh, ancient uh, Israel, but uh, they were ultimately wiped out by the Assyrians and well assimilated uh, by the Assyrians, but uh, the uh, southern kingdom of Judah uh, was able to uh, hold on to identity and so forth enough that uh, this is where, you know, modern day uh, interpretations of, uh, you know, ancient Judaism uh, come from, from them. Uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, it's just fascinating. And obviously, uh, Brandes had the chops and the historical know-how to really take, um, you know, figures from history that uh, were uh, both well, less well-known uh, and, uh, and uh, were denigrated, but to really like take a deep dive into the to the historical and uh, the biblical record and say well you know what if things were a little bit different and of course in that i also love the idea of you know realizing that uh, the bible doesn't have to be static and it's not like you know a sacrosanct version of history these are there's a lot going on in the past if we want to believe that you know there's society in the past and it's not just you know one narrative just like in modern days uh, you know there's not just one narrative of uh, how history and culture and so forth have come to be so one of the things I love about both uh, this book and the next book I'll be talking about is just the incredible nod to world building. I think maybe because the questions Brandis is asking in this book and the other book, they're so big and broad and they're about culture building. That means that I guess the world building also has to be pretty large. Uh, and of course she's, you know, taking from uh, the biblical record. So uh, 
you know, in uh, this book, we're talking a lot about the 12 tribes of Israel. And, uh, you know, and the 12 tribes uh, were descended from the 12 sons of uh, the patriarch Jacob. And we're t talking about the idea that, you know, the kings were supposed to unite them into one nation. But, you know, they aren't one nation. They are 12 tribes that have, you know, a variety of different beliefs. And, you know, obviously, uh, Brandis uh, has to, uh, you know, uh, fictionalize or perhaps, you know, embellish a bit on, you know, things that, you know, might not uh, be real or not, because we don't have, you know, that much records for things. Uh, but uh, I, I think it's not that uh, far of a jump, especially since there's schisms, uh, you know, between the kingdoms and so forth, to say that there were different uh, cultural and heritage beliefs. So like one of the first things that happens in this book is that, uh, you know, uh, we're at the tribe of Ephraim and uh, the tribe of Judah, which is sort of trying to united at the time it's the the rule of king solomon so the tr tribe of judah's in charge and they're going to all the other tribes areas and saying well you can't have your temples anymore and you can't have your festivals anymore because we have to become one nation with one identity so that means you have to do everything you know that we the tribe of judah do you have to celebrate our festivals and come to jerusalem to you know sacrifice in our temple and yada yada so uh i just uh you know that really spoke to me because it's obviously something that continues to this day that you know there's people out there that try to streamline narratives and say that you know different nation states today can only be one thing and we have to you know ignore you know the cultural difference between people. So that sort of thing. I really liked that. And it was an interesting way to uh, introduce our main character, who at the time is a young boy named uh, Shalomoam. Uh, and he ultimately turns into um, a, a real biblical figure who uh, Brandis like uh, embellishes his identity to, you know, make, you know, certain points of a story that I think make a lot of sense. I mean, he goes on a bit of a journey and finds out like his true heritage and all of that. And it intersects with, um, something that's uh, far more uh, officially documented, uh, as it were, uh, with the rule of King David. Uh, his first wife was a woman named Michal, who was a princess and was, in fact, the daughter of King Saul. Like at the beginning, when they were married, uh, Saul and David were, you know, allies, and then ultimately they became enemies. Uh, and uh, so, so Saul, uh, through uh, the text be, uh, is often uh, said to, you know, have lost the favor of God and that sort of thing because we have to venerate David and say that, you know, he deserved to be where he, he got. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, to harken back to uh, speculative elements, uh, there we go with a little bit of that uh, in this book and that there are prophets and that they, you know, decree that God has, you know, spoken favorably or disfavorably about this or that. But uh, in a way, you'd almost uh, could question uh, whether there's veracity in the uh, fantastical elements there, or if it's all just um, a matter of propaganda, which is uh, another huge part of this book, is about looking at the idea of how these stories and that the scribes are, you know, uh, deliberately setting out to, like, have specific biases, like how they shape history and how, you know, they're... <laughs> They can have more impact than swords, basically, in how, you know, we see our past. Uh, and so, so that was fascinating, too. Maybe a little on the nose, the way that uh, uh, Brandis occasionally uh, made, made it into the narrative, but still a fascinating concept. I will say another thing about this book that certainly reminds me of uh, popular fantasy series today is just the lavish amount of uh, courtly intrigue and family drama in a royal setting. I mean, I was reading this as I'm also watching the first season of House of the Dragon on HBO, which is a, uh, you know, a prequel to uh, Game of Thrones, and it talks about the... Uh, basically schisms in the Targaryen family that lead to a civil war, and I'm reading this book and thinking, things in this book are even juicier than that. And it's interesting, too, to kind of compare and contrast about uh, how uh, these schisms in House of the Dragon kind of come from uh, the uh, two women and their children, like uh, the Rhaenyra, the Princess of Black versus Alicent, the Queen of Green, or, you know, that sort of thing, and their children. And in this book, uh, it's even grander than that because, you know, the tribes are descended from the 12 sons of Jacob. And, of course, there's also matriarchs involved. Jacob had uh, children technically with uh, four women, or at least of uh, the, the 12 uh, tribes are descended from four women, although they're 
uh, attributed to two of those women, but in particular, uh, two sisters who were his wives, uh, Rachel and Leah. And so these tribes that are descended from Rachel and Leah uh, often had schisms with each other. So that was also kind of reminding me of the television show and think I was thinking they could really make something really juicy out of this book. And in fact, I think they might be able to uh, improve a little on this book because I think some of the drawbacks of this particular book, particularly at the end of the Michal section, is that it was all sort of gossip that was told off to the side uh, and it wasn't really uh, enough uh, direct action that we were seeing and I thought it would be really incredible to see the action of this book or you know frankly to be honest the action that's depicted uh, in uh, the Bible uh, that uh, tells another spin on this tale. <laughs> uh, so yeah I do think by the end of this book I was getting a little wary of the long pontificating speeches between people that basically was the action. I mean, I really respect how Brandis is driving home the point that, uh, you know, stories matter, but sometimes action matters too. And, you know, being able to follow a narrative that way, especially since this is, after all, a novel depiction of, uh, of uh, that history and biblical scholarship. But overall, I was uh, hugely impressed. And the second book I have to talk about, which was the second that Brandis wrote and the second translated into English, but the first one that I've read or technically listened to on audio, is The Orchard, uh, which was translated by uh, Daniel Liebenson. And I should probably go ahead and say in this case it was read by Dar Rosenberg, and uh, perhaps some of my biases, in fact, you know, that uh, she read with such a you know, a dramatic voice that could really compel you into the story, but I also feel like this particular story is more my thing. <laughs> but anyway, we will get into that. Uh, I will say specifically that this story uh, takes place uh, several uh, centuries later in the first century uh, CE, and it is about basically the advent of rabbinic Judaism. Because where we are now with uh, ancient Israel uh, at the time is that uh, it is a province of Rome, uh, and uh, somewhat recently before this story opens up, in fact, the uh, Jews were driven out of Jerusalem. Uh, and that uh, made major changes for everybody because uh, ancient Judaism, as I'll call it, uh, was uh, based very much on temple practice and sacrifices. And they were forced away from uh, what at the time was now the only temple in Jerusalem. Uh, and so there was a big question for the uh, remaining Hebrews, as they were, who, you know, settled uh, in other parts of uh, near the land, uh, about where we were going to go next and what was going to happen to Judaism next to make sure it survives. And from that comes rabbinic Judaism, a text-based Judaism, where uh, to basically uh, be a Jew, uh, well, I mean, a major thing for uh, learned people, for learned men, is to uh, study the texts, first starting with uh, the, the Bible, uh, and then going from there into the texts that were being extrapolated starting at this time. Uh, basically, the writing down of the oral Torah, uh, and uh, then a bunch of uh, debates around the or oral Torah, which became uh, the Mishnah and the Talmud. Uh, and so these are the rabbis. The major characters in this book are the rabbis who were putting all of this stuff together. So they were part of a sect of uh, Jews uh, that went back uh, to uh, Jerusalem uh, called the Pharisees. In fact, uh, Jesus was also a Pharisee. Uh, and uh, their major uh, impetus was that learned men would uh, be able to uh, study and uh, dictate laws, and that would be like a basis of Judaism. Of course, there's other parts of Judaism as well. First of all, there's uh, men who aren't learned and, you know, work the fields and are salt of the earth sort of people. Uh, there are women, of course, who uh, in all circumstances are basically the second class citizens. <laughs> uh, and uh, then beyond that, going into some of the more incredible world building and how complicated, you know, culture can be, uh, there are other sects as well. Uh, the Sadducees were the temple sect, and they basically got wiped out and couldn't assimilate when uh, Rome uh, forced everyone out of Jerusalem and killed who's, the Jews who stayed, or you know, the ancient Jews who stayed. Uh, and there were some other sects as well. And uh, the other very, uh, important one, I think, to mention in this case would be the Nazarenes, because the Nazarenes were the ancient Christian sect of Jews. You know, there were also, you know, non-Jews uh, who 
were starting to follow Jesus and uh, believe him to be a messiah. But uh, there was a Jewish sect who also believed this and uh, believed him to the, be the messiah. Uh, and for the most part, it seemed like their MO, at, at least in uh, Brandis's story, was to say that we're going to, we're still Jews and we are bound uh, to the covenant. We are God's chosen people to live this chosen way of life. But we're going to go out into the broader world and uh, make sure that uh, the Gentiles convert because, you know, their gods are, you know, heathens and violent and horrible. And we want them to basically uh, follow uh, our God uh, and follow Jesus, uh, who would be sort of their envoy into God since they can't be Jews. Uh, and so uh, that's what uh, the Nazarene sect is kind of sort of up to at the time, or at least the ones who travel to foreign lands. Uh, but otherwise, they're kind of on the outskirts. You know, their other sects have different ideas about whether or not they should be considered part of the Jewish people, because no, none of the other sects, you know, believe Jesus to be the Messiah. Uh, so that's a lot of sort of the schismy stuff that's going on in the background of this world building. The main character of this book is uh, a man called Rabbi Akiva, who uh, was um, a figure, a Mishnaic rabbi, who was very instrumental to the way that we study Torah. Uh, because he looked at Torah and he uh, was able to interpret uh, much more widely than other uh, rabbis were doing. Uh, they were sort of reading the plain text uh, and uh, he was uh, finding ways to be much more creative uh, with uh, what uh, was put down in the Torah. One of the major ways he did that was by even um, analyzing the embellishments uh, that were uh, written on the Hebrew letters. It, this does very much go into a sense of linguistics that those of us without Hebrew knowledge uh, can only sort of uh, get to uh, second hand. Uh, but uh, that is uh, part of what he did. And in general, I think Akiva would be understood to be a forward-thinking sort of person because uh, he uh, is able to uh, take uh, these texts and breathe new life into them so that, uh, you know, we can, you know, understand them in new ways in the future and, you know, continue to engage with them. I am talking from the bias of the fact that his way of uh, interpreting Torah is now really a major cornerstone of Jewish practice. <laughs> uh, most people are, are, I would say, are not very stagnant, I think, even if they claim to be that, like, you know, there's nothing changing in the Torah, in fact, Throughout the ages, uh, people have interacted with the Torah in all sorts of interpretive ways, and he is the one who really made that mainstream. And you know, there's even, there's you know stories in the Talmud which defend his right to do this, like a major one being uh, a, a midrashic tale of uh, Moses going to the mountain and asking God, "Why are you putting these embellishments on the letters?" And God saying, "Well." You know, in a thousand or so years, there's going to be this rabbi called Rabbi Akiva, and he's going to find incredible ways to interpret it. So anyway, that's Rabbi Akiva. He's a very famous, you know, uh, rabbi from uh, Jewish texts. Uh, and uh, this story follows him and his rise to fame, which is also a sort of a rags to riches story because he was... Um, a farmer, a poor, illiterate farmer. He was perhaps the son of converts, which Brandis uh, makes him in her book. Uh, so he is not someone who is at all primed to be what Judaism would consider to be a scholar. Uh, I mean, some Jews at the time said only, you know, the uh, sons of uh, wealthy priests can, you know, study Torah and no one else. And everyone else at least thought, well, you have to start really early. You don't start at 40. You don't, you know, spend 20 years illiterate, or, or 40 years illiterate, I should say, and then, you know, get an entry. But uh, Akiva had someone uh, huge in his corner, uh, basically his wife, who uh, witnessed him sort of interpreting a will uh, in an empathetic way toward all of uh, the sons and the will, and she decided that this was so incredible that uh, she uh, was a prophetess in her own right, basically, is how the story uh, puts it, that she realized that his way of, uh, of interpreting Torah was absolutely needed for the people, and she married him against uh, the wishes of her father and was disowned and lived in destitution and pushed him to uh, go to yeshiva and to study, uh, and uh, he left her for that time. He was a in this book is a rather uh, cold-hearted uh, character in a lot of ways. He's a flawed character in that way toward his wife, and he abandoned her, and in Jewish custom that makes her an aguna, a chained woman who uh, 
doesn't have uh, a lot of recourse to uh, get, get herself out of poverty, she can't remarry, she's often shunned. So that impacts uh, this woman, Rachel, the wife, as a character as well. So Ida, there's just so, there's so much fascinating stuff going in here. This all culminates in the fact that Akiva becomes a rabbi and we get to see other, you know, sages of the time being depicted in their belief systems uh, as uh, sort of extrapolated from the opinions they put into the to the writings, uh, the, the religious writings. And it culminates into the uh, Jewish legend that's in these texts as well of, of Pardes or the Orchard, where Rabbi Akiva and one of his uh, colleagues and then two of their students are able to uh, access this metaphysical world of God, where they can go to this orchard and basically look upon God, which is just, you know, something that is inconceivable, <laughs> basically, in religious thought. Uh, you know, we don't transcend that plane. So what happens is that uh, three of these people meet tragedies. One dies, one becomes a heretic, uh, and leaves the community, and uh, one goes mad, and only Akiva came and went in peace. Although in Brandis's book, maybe not peace so much as just some sense of sanity. <laughs> so anyway, I guess returning to the idea of fantastical elements, uh, that definitely is the biggest one. There's a couple of other uh, uh, Jewish legends uh, that uh, make it into this book as well that are definitely, uh, you know, fantastical, not realist. Uh, so this kind of counts too. But of course, uh, what I'm mostly interested in is the story I love what uh, Brandis did with the Orchard message about what Akiva saw and why it influenced him to take the actions he takes at the end of the book, which uh, ultimately lead to his uh, rather tragic death, uh, the way he was uh, killed, spoiler alert, uh, by the Romans. Uh, uh, so I, I just love this book. I feel like in part because it really spoke to my fascination with rabbinic Judaism and how it formed and it gave me a lot more insight into that. Uh, in fact, that's uh, a major uh, inspiration for my fantasy novels, so I'm rather excited and trying to think of new ways to sort of bolster up my world building for my fantasy novel because uh, I found uh, all of this really fascinating and I found uh, Rachel and Akiva to be complex and interesting characters, uh, so this book really uh, did work for me. And I just loved how Jewish it felt. <laughs> so anyway, there we go. As a parting thought before my outro, I will uh, point you uh, not only to my two Goodreads reviews of these books, but also to two podcast episodes from Judaism Unbound, because one of the hosts of that podcast uh, is in fact Daniel Liebenson, who translated one of these books and also uh, brought both of them basically to the English-speaking uh, market. Uh, and he did so because... Uh, he wanted to bring Brandis's uh, basically uh, interpretations of Jewish texts to us. Uh, you know, she'd been making a splash in Israel, but uh, her novels hadn't been translated. And I'm just so glad these two are. I'd love to see more of them translated. Anyway, these two uh, podcast episodes of Judaism Unbound talk a lot about uh, the implications of uh, challenging and subverting like uh, Jewish texts and uh, what it means to really see these, uh, you know, these these ancient works as living and breathing and alive. Uh, and these uh, two hosts are, you know, well versed in uh, Jewish religion and uh, they I think felt uh, transformed by what they read here too about how uh, it gave them new things to think about. And I think a big MO of Judaism Unbound is uh, basically to unbind Judaism from uh, too much dogmatic thinking and to really think of uh, the religion as living and breathing uh, and something to be interpreted and toiled with. Uh, I really uh, would like to listen to more of that podcast, but I feel like uh, I also have to um, adopt uh, the hashtag uh, too much to audio. <laughs> I have so many podcasts and audiobooks I want to get to, but oh, I, I think I probably would enjoy that podcast a lot. But anyway, again, I'll link to these two interviews uh, down below. And that about covers it for me now. So yes, I really am glad that I did this project, whether or not it's uh, Jewish sci-fi or whatever. I just, uh, these books uh, spoke to me even more than I thought they would. I guess I didn't give it enough thought, but uh, I was very impressed uh, with uh, the world building and the question she was asking and how it all came together. Uh, so. It was a great uh, 
way to spend the month in uh, these worlds, and I'm glad I got to talk about it here with you as we are moving into October. Uh, and speaking of moving into October, uh, we are entering the final quarter of 2022, and in that vein, I have to recap the summer quarter and uh, put up a video of my uh, writing quarterly goals and whether I met them or not and what new ones to hold myself accountable to for the end of the year. So stay tuned for that. I'm thinking a lot of thoughts for the people to the south of me. Uh, I live in the DC area uh, and am this weekend uh, getting a significant amount of uh, overcast weather and rain from the hurricane that is uh, really uh, pounding on uh, Florida right now. Uh, thank goodness a couple of my family and friends have checked in Facebook is safe. But uh, one of my high school uh, classmates actually just wrote a Facebook post uh, that uh, she was devastated by this storm that uh, so far she has lost her home and her, her car and her possessions. Uh, thank goodness uh, she and her family seem to be okay. But yeah, this is uh, harrowing stuff happening with the weather down south. So I hope everyone is staying safe uh, and healthy. I'll look forward to clearer weather ahead uh, when it comes. And in the meantime, Thanks so much for watching everyone, and I'll see you next time.